Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 25, and we'll just be seated for the reading of the scripture. It's a bit of a lengthy passage. We pick up the story here, Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 4, the preaching of Philip in Samaria. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying out with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord, that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Amen. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word uh, this morning. <clears throat> well, we pick up the story uh, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 really is the continuation of what's been going on in the greater area of Jerusalem as it relates to uh, the spreading of the gospel and uh, many of the people who had Uh, come to know Christ. Now we're facing a backlash uh, that was, I think, uh, understandable in the sense that uh, when people's authority, like the religious authorities who were in power at the time, were challenged that they were going to push back, Satan himself pushing back on the movement of Christ uh, throughout the region. One example of that um, faithful preaching and the scattering of believers was Philip. The death of Stephen had just taken place. It was a horrific event in the life of the church. But rather than the church uh, cowering in fear, they were galvanized. And uh, many went out as a result. Philip being one of those, a prominent member of the early church, but now an evangelist going to the hard place called Samaria. Now, it's, it's an interesting story, really. Simon the magician. I don't... Know about you? I've never really been a big one for magic tricks, um, like David Copperfield, David Blaine. You know, there's the Statue of Liberty. Poof, it goes away. You're like, ah, that's a trick. Um, but it, how the trick gets pulled off? You know, the show about the behind the magic kind of thing. I'm more interested in that show because I want to see how they want to see how they did it. But the the trick itself is ah it's something. And in a story like this. I think we're dealing with a a bit of a different kind of magic on on a different scale, totally. But when you see the movement of God, I think there's a bigger issue at hand. The question is, when God moves in a place and people really start to say that they believe, what's really behind their belief? What's really going on here? In any movement, there's going to be people with genuine response and people with what I would call a questionable or even a fake response. And the question really is, not only for someone like Simon, but I think for all of us, is like, what's our real response to hearing the word of God? What's, what's really happening in our heart? I think that's the real question 
least that's the takeaway through my study that I thought through this week. If, if the message has gone out and I've truly believed in it, then my response as I think about it is, is my belief real or is it questionable? Is it based on something that um, I, I would like to see improved in my own life? Am I using God as almost like a cosmic Santa Claus? Like I just, he's out there to make my life better and yes, I believe as long as he does that. Or am I truly looking at belief in terms of this is who Jesus is. He's called me to take up my cross and follow him. He's offered his forgiveness. And the reason I realize I need it is because I would live and I would go through a Christless eternity after death without him. The consequences of which I cannot imagine. I think there's a difference between those two type of responses. And you start to see that emerge in this text. So again... The message goes out by Philip. The question for you and me is simple. Is my response in belief for real or is it questionable? Is it like many of the Samaritans who believed and were baptized and were walking in the joy and fear of the Lord? Or is it like Simon, whose belief structure may have been more motivated by his desire to see his own thing continue? He plays his cards, if you like, in verses 18 and 19. But I want to look at this in just a couple of different pieces. Number one, just the preaching of Philip and the fact that it's real. It's really, this is real, this is real preaching versus sort of gospel peddling. But then secondly, the invitation by the Samaritans to all of us, which is to believe, be baptized, and walk in the joy of the Lord. All of those things are available for us as we hear the Bible. And then lastly, the warning, I think, of Simon's life to all of us. The warning being, what is really motivating and undergirding our belief uh, as we hear the gospel preached. Is it, really, is, it, is it really motivated by what Jesus has done for us, or is it motivated by something else that we'd like to see kind of improve in our lives? Yeah, I think the evidence of that kind of belief comes out later uh, in, in whether people really stick around the deal uh, for the long term or not. We'll look at that in just a minute, but just look at Philip's preaching here in verses 4 through 8. Bible says, now those who were scattered about, uh, the, the, those who were scattered about went about preaching the word Philip. Here's an example. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. It's, it's, it's hard to put into words here. Um, when, when you see the word Samaria, it's hard to put into words the kind of um, ill regard that those who lived in Jerusalem had for those who lived in Samaria. It's just hard to put into words because there was such a division and tension between those two groups of people. Just words cannot really contain it. So the gravity of which, like when Philip as a Hellenistic Jew goes into Samaria, for us to really say, well, it's, it's like, yeah, yeah, we drove into Willoughby, big deal. Well, no, it's actually a much, much bigger deal. It's, it's just hard to put into words the difference between those two cultures, even though they were right next door to each other, and the hatred and tension that existed in uh, between the Samaritan people and the people of Jerusalem that went back thousands of years to the time of Solomon's sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, all the way back to 1 Kings 12. We're talking about thousands of years of hatred and tension. The, Sam the Samaritans were viewed as the descendants of Jeroboam's rebellion against the house of David. So if you think about what was happening in 1 Kings, you had the 12 tribes in the north, two in the south, and you have this, this, uh, this brewing division and tension that's been happening for a long time. In fact, the Samaritans had set up their own rival temple. They had their own bit of the Old Testament that they used to focus on, apart from uh, those from, from Judah. They, they took every, their, every opportunity, even in the intertestamental period from 400 B.C. down to uh, about 5 A.D. to root against the Jews in Jerusalem. For whatever would befall them, they were happy that they were having a hard time. The Samaritans were like a... They almost, almost looked at like a, as like a half-breed type of person. They weren't full-blooded Jews. They weren't full-blooded Gentiles. They were somewhere in the middle. People didn't like them. In fact, when Jesus told the story about the one who was healed from leprosy that would come back to thank him, uh, the, he, he used the opportunity to say, and that person was a Samaritan. Everybody went, whoa. Because they couldn't imagine giving a Samaritan that much credit. They would do something like that. But people just didn't think that way. So when you read this little statement, Philip went down to, to Samaria and preached to them the Christ. It's like, what? Are you kidding? By choice he did that? Yes, he went there. And, and what you start to see in Philip's preaching, the emergence, I think, of someone who is different from just a gospel peddler who's using this thing to sort of further his own bottom line versus someone who's doing it for real, the very first evidence you see is right here. Philip is going to a difficult place. He's not a Samaritan. This is very risky. 
He does it and embraces it. Okay, you see this right away. For those who are engaging in kind of gospel type of work, the embrace of one of the hardest places to go, where you know your reception uh, might, what might, might not be the most positive, I, I think is an evidence of the fact that God is really moving here. He's really doing something. You first, yeah, I think you see that in, in terms of the realness of Philip. I think the second thing that you see here, where it says he preaches the word of Christ, he, pre- he preaches to them the Christ. He preaches them the word. Okay, it's, it's something different about Philip's preaching. It's not about him. He's doing a lot of signs and wonders that's accompanying his preaching, but he's not a self-promoter. You read about Simon here, and there you see this immediate contrast. The people in the city were amazed at him. They thought he was somebody great. In fact, it was really hard to distinguish for a lot of people that listened to Simon and watched what Simon was doing. They say, well, there's God and there's Simon, but we, we can't really even tell the difference. He's got this power. He's amazing. Philip also is doing signs and wonders, but people are not associating Philip with godlike status. It's different. He's not promoting himself. He's promoting Christ. He's preaching the word. He's preaching Christ. Same thing was true with Stephen. It wasn't about Stephen. It was about Jesus. Something different in there. Notice the summary in verse 6. This is real preaching versus gospel peddling here. The people paid attention to what was being said. (laughs) It's amazing. There's all this crazy stuff kind of happening, and people are listening to the message. They're getting it. It's not about the thing. It's about Jesus. Somebody used this illustration I thought was helpful. A little baby, one or two-year-old. And, you know, you've probably seen this play out, but somebody trying to have a little baby see something really cool or fun or different, a toy at Christmas time, say, look, look, look at this. And what does the baby do? The baby grabs onto the finger and is looking at the pointer. And is, no, 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 look at this. But they're looking at the, 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 the signal. This, this happens a lot of times with, with people who uh, are, are, would be what I would consider maybe immature or on their way to true belief. They're more enamored with the sign, the thing pointing to the real thing. Now, there were people here who had gotten past the sign, if you like. They understood who the sign was pointing to. They understood that the, the wonders and the signals and the people being healed and those who were paralyzed being able to move around and walk again were all a pointer to the, the healing that Jesus brings spiritually to their souls. They understood the difference. And you can see in this, what I would call real gospel preaching versus gospel peddling, that, Peter's, or that Philip's bottom line wasn't being improved by all these signs and signals. In fact, he was going to a difficult place. He was doing something very risky, really at, I think, the risk of his own life, but doing so to glorify Christ. And you can see one of the evidences of that as people were really truly believing in Jesus and not walking away saying, wow, that Philip, that guy is so amazing. Did you see what he did? Yeah, we're going to pay him. We're going to come out to our thing. It wasn't about that. It was about who Jesus is and what he had done. There's a difference, and I think there's a contrast, there's a point to be made as you look at Simon and how he is uh, working on his own thing and you see him, in a sense, peddling himself, sort of pre-conversion. But, you know, there's, there's something about a pattern in which people are using self-promotion at the expense of the gospel that's, that, that is so easy for it to happen. It happens a lot. It happens in our day. It's, it's, it's just, it, that, that kind of thing is growing exponentially now through the internet. And so it, it's just so important to see some of these hallmarks just maybe even to ask yourself the question, you know, like what I'm listening to as it relates to a person I might hear somewhere else or might, I might see on TV. Like, is this real gospel preaching or is this, is, is this a kind of peddling where people are talking about improving your life and your lot circumstances, making sure that you get ahead, that every blessing that you're supposed to have is, is in the here and now. I mean, does that really square with New Testament teaching? I mean, would Stephen understand that? Did Stephen not live his best life here, or did he, was he a failure? He's, he's viewed, you know, as, uh, as, as a, such a virtuous figure in the New Testament, ultimately at the loss, the cost of his life. 
Philip, you see the same thing happening now. As his ministry goes into a difficult place, God is, is, at, is at work. Philip's preaching now is an invitation for the Samaritans to believe. It's an invitation to all of us to believe the message, receive the Holy Spirit, and be baptized. I'm going to get to Simon and the warning of Simon's life in just a minute, but just look at the Samaritans here. You know, I think in the receiving of the Holy Spirit and the Samaritan belief in the, the message that Philip is preaching, there's two things going on. One, I think there is a prescriptive element here to all of us in terms of we see something and we say, yes, I mean, there's, there's immediate takeaways from my life, from what I'm seeing with the Samaritan response of Philip's preaching. I, I can see that. But I think there's also a descriptive element here. There's something that was very unique happening in the New Testament time in this place that I don't see necessarily repeated. And when you read the book of Acts, you have to make sure that you navigate that tension. Because if you just make everything kind of prescriptive, then we should be doing things a lot more wild in this church. And you might say, you know, Scott, you've, you're, you're, you're a little boring here compared to what's going on here. Okay, yes, guilty is charged. Now, there's also, if we make this entire thing just a descriptive thing, then this just becomes kind of an exercise in simple learning. This is just a class, you're just a learner, and we're not supposed to really take anything away. And we're not doing that either. But you have to make sure you're looking at these things kind of with those lenses in mind, because I think they come out of this passage. What was normal here, what I think is, is prescriptive for the church, is that people were listening to the message that Jesus had been crucified, that the kingdom had come, that he is a king now sitting on the throne. They are to believe in that. They are to, to sacrifice, in a sense, say, my life belongs to you, Jesus. It doesn't belong to me anymore. Upon the uh, understanding of that, yes, the belief in, in that, the trust of life, to be baptized, go into the water, publicly say, Jesus is my life now, my life belongs to him, and I want people to know that. That's a, that's a normal practice for people who come to that understanding by faith. Receive the word with joy and go on living in the joy and fear of the Lord. That's what we like. I think it's this, just a little commercial too for baptism. That if that hasn't happened, if you profess faith in Christ and you are yet to do that, we would encourage you to take the next opportunity, which we're just putting a class together now, to, to do that. Not a class per se, like I have to learn about it because there's something I don't know, but just how do we think about it? How do you think about it? And how can we help you? How can we help navigate some of the things that might um, get in the way? One thing, of course, for people is giving a speech. They say, I don't want to get baptized because I don't want to give a speech. You know, like, I'd rather die first than give a speech. And we, we, don't, we, we don't want speech giving to be the enemy of baptism. So we want to navigate that tension. Figure out a way. How could we not necessarily have to go to that level, but affirm what Christ has done in your life and affirm that publicly? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to mean people give a speech. And we can get through that. We've thought, we've thought that through and figured it out with people in the past. We'll do it further in the future. I mean, it's great when people do because it has a lot of impact. If you invite people to come listen to what God has done in your life, that might be the one opportunity that someone in your family is going to sit and listen to you or listen to me, heaven forbid. You know, like that, that is amazing that that opportunity would be had and baptism affords that. But there's, there's a normalized thing happening throughout the book of Acts. People believed, they're baptized, they walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's something unusual, though, that's happened here that I think is a description of something that happened back then that I don't necessarily see playing out in our day today. And that's the way in which the Holy Spirit was received. Listen to verse 14. <clears throat> now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard uh, that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now think about what's happening here. Samaria, that's why I went through, you know, I just kind of went through how uh, different Samaria was than Jerusalem. I, I wanted to make that point because that point is going to be helpful to understand this point. The apostles hear about what's going on in Samaria and they go, something's going on there. Now, as much as the, 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 the history with the ethnic tensions that had surfaced were true, they were also true in the lives of the apostles. Okay, so it's, it's not as if, you know, they were somehow immune from this. They had grown up the same way. And here they're thinking, wow, something really is going on down there. We, we have to go and see it for ourselves. This is, it's an important point to be made. It's like another country over there. But what they have to realize is that country is not out of the realm of God's gracious hand and moving. 
It's under the realm of God's gracious hand and moving, and now they are going to see it for themselves. The apostles somehow know that the Holy Spirit, uh, his administration hadn't, in a sense, happened in, in, in a way like Pentecost. And, you know, the, the moving of the Holy Spirit was now going to come in a different way by the hands of the apostles. The real question is, you know, will the, will the Samaritans be able to participate in the church like all the rest? And the answer is yes, yes. They are as much a part of the church as anybody else. As much as their history had been marked by division and separation, that was no longer to be the case. And the apostles were going to take part in that firsthand. The fact that it's public is even more a stark reminder to the church that the two top guys, if you like, are going there to make sure that everybody knows that Samaria is a part of this program. That they are not to be a rival church, a rival group of people with their own thing going, you know, separating and, and, and thinking about their own, you know, kind of doing the, doing th the thing their own way. It's not going to be like that at all. For thousands of years, there was a separation, but no longer. There's a public trip, a public administration beginning of the work in Samaria. It is descriptive in that sense. What is prescriptive, everybody believes they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and in due time they're baptized. What is descriptive is that the Holy Spirit came through the laid on hands of the apostles, showing that the ethnic divide in history was no longer. There is one church, one spirit, one God and Father over all, who is through all and in all, period. It's really important to just think about this point for a second. <clears throat> Some people from different ethnic backgrounds through their history might come to conclusions of thinking that somehow because of the difficulty of the place that they've lived in, that God must not be considerate of where they are or worthy of being a part of his family. Nothing could be further from the truth. Samaria is an example of the fact that God cares for the least, the left out, and the lost as it relates to people groups. Now we typically associate the coming of the Holy Spirit with an individualized sense of empowering. We say, yes, the Holy Spirit has come. He is in my life. He's going to help me live for God. We love the idea of being empowered, yes. But you have to see in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, that the Holy Spirit's moving was about more than that. The Holy Spirit's moving and marking of a group of people show that they were members too in the body of Christ. His work among people groups was the marker to the rest that they too are our fellow co-participants in the church. That every ethnicity has an opportunity to play their part no matter their past. Spirit's coming showed that. It was an explosive concept to the early church. Might have been really, it, it might have been a very interesting discussion between Peter and John going from Jerusalem to Samaria. Can you believe we're going to do this? What is going on down there? I wonder what their family members might have thought when they said, you're, getting, you're, you're packing up to go where? Because God is moving through who? No. He's, he hasn't done that for years. Somebody else says, you know, go back and read Ezekiel 37. There's going to be a unity in the house of David. Yeah, 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 but not here. Absolutely here. That's what Ezekiel was talking about. The two will become one. That's exactly what's going on here now through the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so you see a description here that's very, I think, important for us to understand. And there are takeaways, but there is a, a uniqueness to this event. And I think, too, we have to be very careful not to read passages like this and think that there is some kind of two-stage initiation into Christianity. In other words, that, you know, you have a, a time of baptism and then a delay, and then a time where church officials come around and confer the Holy Spirit onto you. You don't see that anywhere else really happening in the New Testament with any kind of regularity, except that you see it here, just in this passage, which should make you wonder if the operation of any kind of denomination happens that way, is it really scriptural? I'm not saying to bash any kind of denomination, like, oh, you, you know, you're, you're against Roman Catholics or whoever else. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying you need to read the entirety of the New Testament as it relates to the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
the normative movement of the Holy Spirit comes right at conversion. You see this throughout the New Testament, but you see this special case here as it relates to the Samaritans because of the history. But it's very important to see that it's not me who's going to come, you know, and confer a spirit upon you because I'm somehow more blessed. It's not like that. I think in a similar respect, and, you know, sitting in this room, you know, we, we, we bought, uh, our, we, we, we purchased this church from the uh, Assembly of God for, from the state of Ohio, and so I'm certainly not going to bash them either, but we, ha- we have to think through some of the differences as it relates to what people might say is a two-stage initiation to Christianity, even on the Protestant side of things. That there is a reception of the Holy Spirit that comes with immediacy when a person is converted, okay, truly converted. That there isn't a delay, and again, a waiting for a prayer or something more special to happen, and then some kind of a fuller realization of the power of the Spirit. You just don't see that in the New Testament. You do read about fullness and filling. Filling a command that we all are under um, equal responsibility to, to take heed of. But it's important to see that there was really one step here. But in this case, there was something different than happened because of this group of people. The reason I bring that up is because I, I just hear people blur lines and say, you know, we all think the same thing. Actually, we don't. We don't. And we have to look at the scripture to make sure that we understand what is being prescribed and what is being described. Just so that we don't live under confusion. Now, the, the invitation is for us all. Hear the word, believe, be baptized, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a warning here, I think, as well, in the person of Simon. His questionable response, I think, <clears throat> a warning to all of us. Pick up the story. Simon now, the apostles are, are now laying hands. Verse 17 They received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that that, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. All right, so Simon Simon isn't a a local celebrity because he was doing card tricks. All right, We, We know that to be true. Simon was dealing in, I think, something much more significant than what I would say even dangerous in terms of the occult. He was able to harness powers that were not his own. He was, he, was, he was very well known. He was probably very wealthy in the sense that he could be a means of protecting or be a means of even cursing uh, people and dealing with the spirit realm of things. He trafficked in something that was otherworldly. It gave him a lot of notoriety and likely a lot of money. People associated him with like a godlike status. Okay, so here is what he's known for in Samaria. And it would have been in keeping with the Samaritan people because there was a kind of syncretistic part of their worship where they blended, you know, some of the things that they had known from the Old Testament with some of the things that uh, were, were true to them as, a, as an ethnic people. There was a belief structure that was a little bit more kind of play doh as it related to their, uh, some of their understandings of things. And Simon easily could have picked up on things like that trafficked in uh, spirits and, and, and made some money off of it, people would have known who he was. The message of Philip gets to the heart of Simon, though, in, in, a, in a certain way, and thus becomes the challenge. He believes. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Okay, so he did what everybody else was doing. He believed. And then he got baptized. And, and some might say, well, yeah, Scott, I think you're being a little bit hard on Simon. You know, he's like, a, maybe he's like a new believer, but he's really misguided. You know, like he, um, you know, had, uh, he, he had some ideas about what Christianity was. And, um, you know, maybe he was a true Christian, but he just, he just needed some clarification at the beginning. I think you could make a case for that. I think if someone did, I might listen to that case. I wrestled with it this week. What was really going on, going on in Simon? I'm not going to die on a hill for my, my take on Simon, but I, I just hope that maybe the balance of the text gives us a little more clarity, at least where I'm going. He runs into some trouble here that's hard to miss, and it might be more of a window into his soul in verses uh, 18 and 19. He initially responds with amazement. He's kind of like the second, you know, the parable of the soils, the sower. You know, the seed that's sown on the rocky soil, it, it, it's received with joy, 
um, but it has no root. A time of testing comes and it dies. You know, it, it's, there's, there's, there's some seed that gets sown that's immediately um, responded to, but over time it kind of shows that it was never really rooted. And I think his, his tell here, to use a, a card-like phrase, is poker tell, is verses 18 and 19. When Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also, give me this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, just, this is interesting, because he's used to harnessing power. He's used to trafficking in this kind of thing. He sees Philip, and he goes, wow, this guy is amazing. This guy is doing things that I, I could never do. And so he sees what's going on here, and he has a belief of some kind, a faith, if you like. But the question is, is it a, is it a carrier cross kind of faith, like Philip and Stephen, or is it more of a belief where you harness God's power to really get what you want? And this, I think, is the rub. And this is the difference. This is, I think, where the knife cuts very, very deep. Because there are some people who listen to the message, and the, and the message that they hear is, God is there to make my life circumstances better. And if I believe in him, I think he'll do that. So yes, I believe. And they don't stay around church very long because life gets hard again, and they look at God and say, you must really not be working. I think I'm going to try something else. I think I'm going to go back to the way that I was kind of doing it. And life becomes kind of a mess and a little bit tragic, because it's, it's, it's easy to put a kind of faith or belief in God when you're still on the throne, when it's still all about you. And people at a very young age can do this, like, I believe because my mommy and daddy say I should believe, and then go through large, large, large portions of life wanting nothing to do with Christ. The tragedy and the heartbreak is is that we might have some kind of sense of false assurance that because they raised their hand or said something, something must have changed. But we can't explain why they have absolutely no heart for God. It's really difficult. And I don't say this flippantly. I say it with every bit of fear and trembling because people I love, people I've walked with, people I've worked with, have, have, have been here. And it's not as if I know their heart. You know, like, oh, what are you, the final judge on people's heart? You know who my sister is? No, I, I don't. I just know that there is a kind of messiness that happens in a person's soul when they're, when they're, when, when they're making professions of, of belief. Sometimes at Parkside, we call people like this professing unbelievers. That is, they're close. They understand things. But they may not necessarily be over the goal line. Well, how do you know that? Sometimes it's just in the way we're consistently dealing with issues. In other words, sometimes the, the impetus and the power to change behavioral patterns isn't just something that we're going to be able to jerry-rig here. It's got to be a true change of the heart first, and perhaps that heart change really hasn't happened. It's just heartbreaking. But it's also understandable that sometimes when people are in a desperate situation, they would just say, God, please come and change my circumstances, my lot in life. But Jesus died because he knew that a terror that awaited you was far greater than the terror of your present circumstances. The terror that awaits is a Christless eternity. And there are people, for sure, that in the midst of their, difficulty, their difficult circumstances turn and say to God, you know, I'm actually the reason for this. It was my sin that broke your law that led to the circumstances that are happening now. It was my response to what was done to me that's actually led me down a darker path. And Lord, I believe. And certainly there are times where people say, you know, I've been on the throne. My life is a mess. But Christ, you're on the throne. You died for my sin. I believe in you. I don't, I, I don't want to wake up one second after, my die and, after I die and be against you. I am for you. I am with you. Certainly, life circumstances can lead people there as well. Peter's prayer here, I think, for the Simons, if you like, is helpful. Because Peter confronts him, but he also, in a sense, calls him to pray. Prays for him, if you like. And I think his prayer is a good beginning to our prayer. 
for the Simons in our life. First part of his prayer, Peter says, verse 20, 21, you have neither part nor lot in this matter. Verse 21, for your heart is not right before God. Literally what he says here is, your heart isn't straight. It's not straight, it's crooked. Okay, there's something happening in the hard wiring of your heart. I think what he's saying here that needs to be addressed. If you think about it, you know, the Simons in our life, we, we might pray that they'll come back to church or back to the family or that their behavioral patterns will change. But what we actually need to do is pray first for their heart to get right. Because as the heart goes, then the behavior follows. So Lord, we pray for the Simons. Get your heart right. Prioritize that first. Peter then says, you need to repent. What does that mean? You need to go a rigorous through a rigorous self-examination, self-confrontation, where you understand by God's grace that you turn away from prioritizing yourself and you prioritize him. That you recognize that the way that you're currently walking is a way toward destruction. By God's grace, you turn away from that destruction and you pursue him. That doesn't mean your life is going to automatically get better. It just means that that destruction that you can currently are pursuing is going to lead to a greater destruction if you don't get off that path. To repent is to turn. What Peter is saying here is to turn away from this thinking. Pray to the Lord that it be possible that the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. See, he's going into the heart. The intention of the heart is where he is. This takes a miracle that only God can do. And the third part of his prayer is basically that the bond of slavery would be broken in his heart. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. In other words, there is an enslavement happening in your soul that only Jesus can break. And I pray that he breaks it. There's a bond that we can't deal with here. But God can. And he has when Jesus walked out of the tomb. When Christ breaks in, and I think this is really where the hope is, something begins to change. And maybe something's even starting with Simon's answer. Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you've said may, may come upon me. But even in that prayer, he's not saying, oh Lord, he's saying, why don't you do it? You're the guys with the power. Maybe you can pray it for me. But maybe he's taken a step on that path. I'd like to, I like to read these passages with a little bit of hope. And I, I think, you know, as you, as you read a passage like this, it's, a, it's an invitation and it's a warning. The people who received the word continued on with joy. That continual reception with joy is not necessarily saying, God improved my life today. No, it's saying, God is glorified today through whatever he brings me. It's for his glory and my good that I live. That's, that's it. And you can actually have joy even in the midst of difficult circumstances with that perspective in mind. It's really tough because there's a lot of Simons in our lives and there's some Simons here in the room today maybe that are a bit confused. And I certainly don't want to lead those who have truly trusted in Christ into a, any kind of despair and thinking maybe I'm not assured here, but maybe just kind of roust a belief system or at least bring some of this up from the surface to say, if life is just always all about you and God is simply up there to make your life better, it's not a surprise that you would leave the church and come back every time something goes wrong. Because God's only there kind of when you need him. But it's really you that life is about. And certainly, I'm not telling you to walk out of church. I want you to keep listening. But I want to think through Simon's response as a way of saying, you know, this pattern in your life it has to stop. There are certainly those people who are way outside of the faith community that heard the word and responded in kind. They responded positively. And I think you'll see them in heaven one day. There's plenty of other people that said, you know, my history, I'm fine because I, I grew up in the church. I said a prayer. I'm, 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 you know, but I'm just kind of doing my thing, biding my time. To the Simons, we say, 
what Peter said. You really need to get your heart right. <clears throat> any any kind of magic trick, there's going to be some kind of thing happening where there's something real and something not real. Something kind of fake. Any kind of movement of God, there's something real in terms of response and there's something that is questionable. Maybe even fake. And I think what you have in a story like this is basically this invitation and this warning. The invitation to truly believe, be baptized, and walk in the fear of the Lord and know that your life circumstances may not immediately improve because of that belief, but that's really not what's underlying this. It's really understanding that. Christ has come and has forgiven you, and he's broken the bond, the chains of, and the bonds in your life that are leading to the kind of behavioral patterns that you're seeing happening now. He's, he's broken those. He wants you to trust in him, because all of that bondage is going to lead you to a greater destruction, a Christless eternity. But there are going to also be those who are listening and say, you know, I just, I, I just need a little bit of God in my life to make it through this harsh winter. And that's where Simon maybe stops us. And the rebuke of Peter is instructive. That we would see this and say, yes, you know, I, I, I don't want to continue on in that kind of thinking about God. Because that's not the real God. That's not the God of the universe. Peter gives us, I think, a helpful prayer to pray that we would look to Christ, that we put our hope in Christ and see that the signs were pointing to someone way more majestic than we could ever imagine, that his love for us is way better than we could ever think of, that he's the true object of our belief, and his spirit shows us that anyone, anyone, can become a part of his family by trusting in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you've given us this word as both an invitation and a warning that Stephen's preaching was not a peddling kind of thing that improved his bottom line, but it was risky, it was costly. And even he disappears midway through the story, and the result of your work becomes primary. The glorification of you takes full and center stage. We pray, Lord, that that will just happen in our lives day by day. We may not consider ourselves a Philip or a Stephen. We may be going to what we're going to do tomorrow morning, but we pray that we will again in our minds I see you as on the throne. We your servants. Whatever you give us happens for your glory and our good. Help us to embrace you through whatever those circumstances might be and that you might strengthen our belief. Lord, help us. Help our unbelief. Strengthen our belief, we pray, as we go from this day in Jesus' name. Amen.